So we started to do this thing where we weren't talking to each other as much as we normally do. We didn't, and because we didn't talk to each other, we didn't get to know each other, and because we didn't get to know each other, we didn't appreciate each other as much. And then it, and then it became even harder trying to associate and get things done, you know, the, the business of the day. How many of you experience this sometimes? Like you're talking to somebody from the city and you're like, where's all the attitude coming from? Why do they think I'm the enemy? Anybody ever had that feeling? You're talking to somebody and like, what's going on here? A few? Yeah, maybe more than a few. So I read a good book recently. I see some of you have stuff, uh, pencil and pen to write with. I read a good book recently. It's not a hard read, and it's called um, Talking to Strangers. It's by Malcolm Gladwell. Anybody a fan of Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah? Which one have you read? Tipping Point, excellent. And which one did you read, sir? Which one? Outliers, yeah, I loved it. And he talked about how that's where the 10,000 hours comes from. You know, if you do something for 10,000 hours, you are an expert. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Thank you for that. So in talking to strangers, Gladwell takes apart a bunch of famous scenarios like the Bernie Madoff situation, you know, the biggest Ponzi scheme ever where he robbed millions and millions of dollars from people by taking in their finances and, and then using the money for other things. That's essentially what a pyramid scheme is. Um, he also took apart the Sandra Bland case, which was the story, anybody, Sandra Bland? The uh, black lady that gets stopped uh, for a minor traffic infraction in Texas. White cop gets out of the car. You guys probably saw it. The, the video's on YouTube. It's been viewed millions of times because this cop does everything you could do wrong in a traffic stop. And by the way, the civilian, Sandra Bland, isn't on her best behavior either. And it's not a good ending for Sandra Bland, who gets arrested for this minor infraction. All it had to be was running a stop sign. It turns into a whole bunch of other stuff. They lock her up, and she commits suicide in jail. And each one, each chapter of this book, Talking to Strangers, Gladwell takes it apart, and he says, it's not so much about what you think is happening here. It's the inability to talk to strangers. It's the inability for us to figure people out in enough time to keep something bad from happening. It's a, it's a great read, even if you just buy it to read a couple of the chapters. Another one is Amanda Knox, the lady from the States who was arrested in Italy for a killing. Anybody, a triangle thing, sloppy deal. She went to prison for seven years, eventually acquitted, right? Why did she go to prison for seven years? Because we couldn't figure it out. We couldn't figure out what was really happening because we weren't paying attention to signals and, and things that we should be watching. There's a lot of research that none of us are nearly as observant as we think we are. You know, we, we get convinced that we're really the sharpest knife in the drawer, and, not, and we're not. And so when we take extra care, when we practice something called careful communication, see careful is spelled with one L, but when you spell it with two L's, the communication is full of care, and then you're less likely to leave details aside that can cause you problems later. This is the essence of really good customer service, that you're, re you're, you're really paying attention to signals. I imagine law enforcement has to do this a lot when they walk into a home on a domestic violence call, and they have to figure shit out in seconds. Who's been drinking? Are there any weapons in the home? I went on a ride along with an old mate of mine from high school named Dan Frazier. He was a cap, I don't know if he was a captain. He was on the Sheboygan police force, small little town. And, um, <laughs> and I was going up north and he says, so you wanna do a ride along? And I had never had a chance to ride in the front seat of a police car before. And I said, well, sure, let's go. And, uh, and I said, would you mind if I write an article about it for my blog? He says, why do you think I'm inviting you? He says, that's why we do that kind of thing. Do you do it in Plymouth, ride-alongs? I, I think it'd be, it's a, is it kind of a community relations thing when you guys do it? Do you do it for other reasons? Candidates for law enforcement. Yeah, yeah. But it's an eye-opening thing, man. If you ever get a chance to go, do not turn down the opportunity. It is eye-opening to be in that squad car and roll up on something and watch people's faces 
people who might normally or might under other circumstances be glad to see police. But the expressions that you see, it's just bizarre, man. And so, um, Dan told me we're going to do mostly uh, traffic stops, probably. He said, if we get any calls, we get them. He said, you can't control that. But what we'll do is um, set up the radar on the side of the road, and we'll stop some people for speeding, and you can at least see what that is about. I said, great. It'll all be good for me. And I started getting enchanted, not just with the interaction between the police officer and the people he stopped, but the first 15 seconds of that traffic stop. The first 15 seconds. Why? Because a lot of stuff happens in the first 15 seconds. You and I call it a first impression, if we talk about it at all, which we often don't. But the tone and, the, and, and even the resolution is all set up in the first 15 seconds. It's like seeing a movie where they tell you everything you need to know about the ending in the first few minutes. There are movies like this. And then the rest of it just unfolds, you know? So we, st we stop uh, a guy. And I'm in the car, and I dis right away I figure out Dan knows a lot about this car before he even gets out of his vehicle. What do you think? You, you probably know some of this stuff. What does he know for sure, for sure, when he gets out of the car? Anybody? You guys can't answer. What's he know for sure? Maybe how many people. Certainly he can see heads. He can count the heads. Although on a couple of the stops, he actually knocked on the trunk as he walked to the front of the car. Why do you suppose he did that? Yeah, because you can tell if a trunk is hollow or full by knocking on it. That's what he told me. He also tried the latch one time. You know, it's a dangerous time to be a police officer. And sometimes, you know, you'd like to know what's in the trunk. I'm just telling you what he did that day. I don't know how much of that's your policy here. He also knows who owns the car, true or false. If he can run the tag, he knows who owns the car. Somebody in audiences like this, sometimes people say he knows who's driving the car. No, he does not. And he also does not know what's in the car. So when he approaches, I don't have a chair here to show you, but if you imagine that I'm in a driver's seat right now of a car, the police officer, when he approaches the car in that first 15 seconds, he could stand right here where it's really easy to see him, but he doesn't. Where does he stand? Anybody? Yeah. How'd you know that, sir? <laughs> we all have. We all have. I remember thinking one time, because I have been inebriated every time I've been stopped, but I remember, why are you standing way back there? And there's a reason for it, you know? Statistically, and I know these guys have been fully trained. I have not. I'm just telling you what he told me that day. This was years ago. Is that statistically speaking, most people are right-handed. Overwhelming percentage of the population. And if there is a weapon in the car, a gun, knife, mace, it takes an extra fraction of a second to get the reach all the way over to here, right? And by the way, there's a post in most cars, if it's not a convertible, that can be used uh, for a defense mechanism if the officer needs it. So there's lots of reasons to stand back there. And by the way, when he stops his car, he didn't stop directly behind you parallel like this. He, he angled you know, the ass end of the police cars out into the street, you know this, and that's to protect him from oncoming traffic, her from oncoming traffic. So there's all these things in place in the first 15 seconds. And the moral of the story is that in most of our interactions with people, the first 15 seconds is not a matter of life or death. It's certainly not a matter of life and death when people come to City Hall and want to talk to a clerk about something. And yet the first 15 seconds sets the tone for everything that's about to happen. Which is why customer service people are taught to smile and nod their heads and, you know, and, and do the, all those things. Which, it's, which is hard to do if you're having your own bad day. <laughs>